Hi, I'm Michael Stittle. And I'm Nick Nanos. Uh, and welcome to Trendline, a podcast about polling. You can find us wherever you find your podcast every two weeks. And also you can find us on YouTube. Nick, I have to say, it looks like you've uh, escaped Ottawa from, from this Zoom call. Yes, pollster escapes Ottawa. Is that what the headline <laughs> is in the newspaper? It That's is cr- March. As you might have noticed, Michael, I'm not wearing a suit and tie. It's because I'm taking a little bit of a break with my family, but there's still so much stuff going on. That's why hmm. we're still having our podcast. But uh, I'm in a place that is uh, marginally warmer. How's that? Marginally warmer than Ottawa. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Nick, also someone else who's, who's left Ottawa, the the uh, Ottawa uh, trucker convoy protesters, they, they have gone from Parliament Hill, but they have left behind, a, I would say, a, a big impact on political discourse in Canada. Uh, Canadians are using the word freedom now. So in this episode, we'll talk about how that's impacting the conservative leadership race. Uh, we'll also look at Alberta Premier Jason Kenney, how he's kind of cashing in from the rising price of oil. And this week, Ukrainian President uh, Vladimir Zelensky addressed Canadian Parliament. So we'll see how uh, the Trudeau government responded to that. Uh, so first of all, Nick, I, I thought freedom was one of those words that you know gets used a lot south of the border, but, but not so much here in Canada. Is, is that changing? Well, you know, the thing is, we track every week the top unprompted national issue of concern. Canadians can say whatever they want. But, Michael, check out the board. This basically gives a snapshot of uh, the most recent wave of national issue polling. Not a big surprise. Coronavirus is top at around uh, 13 percent. But look what's in second. Hmm. Free speech slash freedom. Environment at 8.3. Environment at 7.5. The truckers protest and that kind of stuff still at 6.8. And you know what, Michael? In I've been polling now. Wow. I think it's been for 35 years and unprompted. Freedom and free speech has not really been on the agenda or on the radar Mm. uh, from a public opinion perspective. But it looks like, you know, for a noticeable proportion of Canadians unprompted, it's on their minds as to the one thing that they're worried about. This could speak to the long tail impact of the uh, convoy, the truckers convoy and and on uh, political discourse. And I think it's going to be an interesting number to watch to see whether it goes up, down or maybe goes sideways. But it's definitely on the agenda for Hmm. a a noticeable proportion of Canadians unprompted. Is is it fair, Nick, to kind of tie this uh, this to sort of a rise to American style populism in in Canada? Well, I I think we can tie it specifically to the 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 truckers convoy after all it was called the freedom convoy Mm -hmm. so i think it is very fair to attach it to that um and it is american like uh because that is an issue in the united states but it's part of a broader populist movement that we're seeing in in canada the united states and the united kingdom and, and other major democracies and i think what it puts a spotlight on is that Coming out of this pandemic, and let's hope that we are coming out of this pandemic, that there's a there's a noticeable proportion of Canadians who believe that their freedoms have been impinged on or infringed on hmm. by governments as governments try to fight the pandemic and vaccinations uh, being at the top of the list and restrictions on uh, on the movement of people. Hmm. So I'm not surprised. But, you know, the other thing, when we go a little further down that that board, uh, extremism, you know, 3.1, not a lot of people, but extremism usually isn't on the radar uh, on the uh, on the top national issue of concern. Right. And it speaks to the fallout of the of the freedom convoy, the truckers protest, uh, where not only are there Canadians that are concerned about freedom of speech and their freedoms, there's also uh, some Canadians who are concerned about extremism. So a little bit of a Hmm. New twist or a couple new twists in the in the issue tracking. We'll see whether this uh, continues or whether it's part of a new normal for Canadian hmm. politics. And and this all comes amid the conservative leadership race. Uh, and Pierre Polyev, uh, considered a, a front runner for for you know recently, he's he was an early supporter of the the convoy. Uh, and he's really tapping into this. But now we're seeing uh, candidates uh, emerging who are running in opposition to that, uh, Jean Charest and Patrick Brown. Yeah. And are we allowed to say that uh, Pierre Poiliev is uh, hitched his caboose to the convoy? I don't know. I guess, <laughs> yeah. I guess since it's a truck, it's not a train. So anyways, but <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is that uh, Pierre Poiliev has seen the, uh, 
the Freedom Convoy as a significant opportunity from his perspective mm-hmm. uh, to mobilize, to have a platform, to connect with voters, probably to appeal to some of those voters who have been thinking about voting for the People's Party to keep them in the conservative tent mm-hmm. and to try to uh, get them behind his, uh, his, his leadership claim. But now we're seeing some, uh, some other folks uh, throw in their hat, uh, more notably uh, former Premier of Quebec, Jean Charest, and also uh, former leader of the conservative, progressive conservatives of Ontario, mm-hmm. now mayor, Patrick Brown. Uh, yep. Both of those individuals, formidable forces uh, within the conservative party and the conservative movement in Canada, as is Pierre Poiliev. But those other two have, uh, have staked out a bit of a different position than uh, Pierre Poiliev more on the progressive side. And there's already been some bickering on, uh, on Twitter, you know, fights. I don't know. It's not like thumb wrestling, but anyways, oh, uh, yeah. we're, we're seeing them duke it out on things like uh, the Nick cab and, mm-hmm. uh, and stuff like that, where there's been some jabs specifically between Patrick Brown and uh, Pierre Poiliev on some of the, some of the more controversial policies of the, of the Harper government. So, uh, so yeah, but here's uh, here's a, here's a prediction. And, and I shouldn't even make this prediction, but here's some predictions. Uh, Patrick Brown will be one to watch because he was very successful in getting the Ontario progressive conservative leadership. He's very well organized. He's very methodical. He's, he, he understands and is good at putting boots on the ground. Sheree will also be a force in this leadership, although it'll probably be very different. Think of air war from, uh, from Sheree building on, mm his network over the last 30 years within the conservatives and the progressive conservatives. And we have to say, if you're a conservative, true blue conservative, the L word, word liberal, uh, Jean Charest was the liberal uh, leader of the province in Quebec and mm-hmm. also the liberal premier, although liberal in Quebec usually means something a little different than. Yes. He, country. yeah, he really, uh, in, uh, I think last Sunday he was on uh uh, question period talking to Evan Solomon about this and then you know I he's he's he says he is not a liberal he wants to make that clear of course I know, but it's, it's got to be tough it's got to be tough like let's face it the conservatives have just come off a leadership race where Aaron O'Toole who throughout the race looked quite conservative and true blue and mm-hmm. appealed to the base and then turned to be more progressive and there were a lot of conservatives especially in the conservative federal caucus that were upset uh, that he was progressive so I don't, I don't know how Jean Charest can put a happy face on the fact that he actually was a provincial liberal in the province of Quebec mm-hmm. and that he should be and has been more progressive than others. I'm not sure if he can out conservative Pierre Poiliev or even other uh, conservative, more conservative minded uh, leadership hopefuls like Leslie Lewin, uh, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the thing is, she's going to be another interesting dynamic and person to watch. Will she do better than last time? What will her role be? Who might she support? Uh, in the future if she doesn't make it through to the very end. And she's going to be one to watch too because she did very well in the last leadership. We'll see whether she can even up her game and do even better than she did last time in order to build a bigger base for herself within the Conservative Party. And, and Nick, historically, as, as we've seen in these leadership races, sometimes it's, it's the, you know, the person pulling uh, second or third who usually comes out on top. I, I think most, you know, in recent memory, there's a, there's a famous liberal convention uh, that you were at uh, that, that had kind of a surprise ending, let's say. Yeah, we're going we're to call these shotgun deals. Right? Right. I'm not sure even if sure that's the right turn of phrase. But these deals where two candidates, for example, would have perhaps a secret agreement mm-hmm. to say if one of the two comes ahead of the other, the person that is behind them will uh, support them. The, one of the more recent and famous ones had to do with Gerard Kennedy mm-hmm. uh, of Ontario liberal fame when he was seeking the federal leadership, when he was up against Stéphane Dion. Those mm-hmm. two had uh, had a, an arrangement where they agreed, the campaigns agreed that whoever came ahead of the other would get the support. And that actually put Stéphane Dion ahead of Bob Ray and allowed him to capture the liberal leadership. So it'll be interesting to see whether there might be similar types of secret or perhaps not so secret arrangement between like-minded candidates and I would expect that the ones at the top of the list, John Charest and Patrick Brown, because they're both progressives, they're kind of fishing in the same sea for, uh, for conservative, might be a little more progressive minded. Hmm. And those would be the two that 
probably be the top candidates to have some spoken, unspoken, secret, public arrangement that if one came ahead of the other, that support would swing to the person that got the greatest number of votes on the first ballot. That's assuming someone doesn't win on the ballot. But got to yeah. watch out for these shotgun political arrangements because sometimes they lead to crazy outcomes. That's for sure. Uh, I, I'm fascinated with, with how this is going to turn out. Uh, Nick, now in Alberta, we could have uh, another leadership race there if uh, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney doesn't do well in his leadership review coming up next month. Uh, we've also seen Brian Jean, former Wild, Ro- uh, Wild Rose Party leader. He just won a by-election. He's, he's now in the United Conservative Party himself. Uh, so Jason Kenney kind of has to watch his back there potentially. But with the rising price of oil, uh, Kenny seems to be uh, cashing in on that. Yeah, we've been really watching Alberta provincially quite closely. And, you know, the thing is, Jason Kenny, you love or hate the guy. He was one of Stephen Harper's most successful cabinet ministers. Uh, he did a good job as a cabinet minister, both politically and in terms of the portfolios that he held. And he merged, uh, he merged the, the fragmented and divided conservative movement. Mm-hmm. In, in Alberta and won an election. You know, there's a lot of tick boxes there on the, on the positive side of the ledger. But, you know, the, the pandemic hasn't generally been good for, for Jason Kenney and his, uh, his, his management on some of the restrictions has met with kind of a bit of a mixed bag. Mm. But, and the polling, the polling actually has favored uh, the New Democrats and Rachel Notley his former nemesis. I guess this sounds like super political superheroes, right? Nemesis <laughs> of Jason Kenney. Right. <laughs> Maybe she's coming back. Uh, but here's one significant game changer, and this has to do with what are the levers at the disposal of Premier Jason Kenney. The rise in the cost of oil or the price of oil kind of cuts both ways. First of all, it's an issue related to inflation and the cost of gas, but mm-hmm. also it hypothetically or could in the short term and the medium term mean good news for Alberta's finances and the treasury. And we, we've seen the first move where Jason Kennedy has come out in order to reduce the tax on gasoline in his province mm-hmm. and kind of started to take on the federal liberals and attack them. And I would expect that if the treasury in Alberta starts to improve, it'll give Jason Kenney scope and latitude to try to stimulate the Alberta economy to invest in key services and to have kind of that, those kind of pre-election goodies, but he's got to watch out for that by-election that just happened with mm. John, who, uh, who's now in caucus, the former leader of the, uh, of the wild rose. Now he's in caucus. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I, do we say that Jason Kennedy has to look over? Is he going to look over? <laughs> over his shoulder? It's definitely not his left shoulder. Yeah. But, uh, there's just a lot of interesting dynamics between the rising price of oil and what it means for the treasury, potential new spending for the provincial government, the pandemic being behind, hopefully uh, in Alberta, like it is in other places. And, uh, and what I'll say, leadership, I don't know, we kind of lurkers, leadership contenders, leadership wannabes in Alberta, mm-hmm. kind of seething back into the political mix for the United Conservative Party. No. Oh. Uh, Nick, we're going to take a quick break, uh, but when we come back, we'll talk about Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's uh, address to Canada's parliament. Nick, uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky gave an address to Canada's parliament and he asked MPs directly to support a no-fly zone uh, over Ukraine to to stop uh, Russia's aerial bombardments. Um, uh, how, what do you make of this? What do you think Trudeau uh, Trudeau's government can can do? Well, you know there are certain limitations because we as a as a NATO ally we're limited in terms of you know participating or supporting a fly zone or no fly zone because that's a NATO decision. But this is this is we haven't seen something like this where the leader of a major country a major democracy. Mm -hmm. is basically touring the world virtually to try to rally support because he's in in his capital and it's under siege or will be under siege and bombardment by the the Russians. 
And this kind of uh, this kind of cuts both ways. And there's been a general recognition that the, the president of the Ukraine has done a phenomenal job in the face of adversity and trying to fight the misinformation that the Russians are putting out. Uh, and also to, to rally not just Ukrainians in the Ukraine, but Ukrainians around the world to support their homeland. Um, so this kind of cuts both ways because, you know, he comes, does a presentation to Canada, and of course it rallies support for the Ukraine. But we start, for some people, they might be stacking up Canada's prime minister against the president of the Ukraine. The president mm-hmm. of Ukraine is looking pretty good right now. However, when we, we were talking about the, the Freedom Convoy, and during that period, uh, there, was a, there was a time when, you know, although Canadians supported the actions of Justin Trudeau, his brand took a bit of a hit. This has been a bit of a reset. It's kind of like changing the channel. The, the, Ukraine, the war in the Ukraine has changed the channel. And, you know, let's put up the board. We can check out the latest ballot numbers. We can see that we have the Liberals at 32%. The Conservatives at 29, NDP at 22, up full five percentage points, BQ at six, People's Party at five, Green Party at around 4.9. But the thing is, is that when we look at the movement, what was a tie, an absolute numeric tie four weeks ago, the Liberals are starting to show some positive movement. It's still within the margin of error of 3.1 percentage points, 19 times out of 20. But Mm -hmm. it is noticeable and it speaks to Justin Trudeau having a platform, looking very prime ministerial, putting the truckers convoy and the freedom convoy behind him and controversies related to the the pandemic and all that other stuff. And uh, him looking uh, like a world leader alongside Canada's allies in in trying to support uh, the the Ukraine. And and, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is is heading back to Brussels for another uh, NATO meeting later later this month. Uh, And Anita Anand is, is there as well this week, I believe. Uh, uh, Nick, I think you said also during the pandemic that uh, the Liberals were sort of flat because they weren't really doing anything new in, in terms of policy or how they're tackling it. And, and this is sort of them taking action on something. Yeah, well, Canadians generally, and you know, this isn't just true for the current environment. This is true in general. Whenever Canadians see the government or a government or prime minister being proactive, being out in the news and stuff like that, usually they give a, there's a little bit of a tip of the hat hmm. politically on that front. And uh, the Ukraine has been uh, an issue where uh, the the prime minister has been very active. The liberal government has been active. Hey, and you know what? We didn't mention a number of liberal cabinet ministers have Mm -hmm. been active, like Christia Freeland and uh, Anand, the the, uh, minister of defense. Mm -hmm. Also potential leadership hopefuls. Not saying that people are counting the days when Justin Trudeau might or might not be prime minister. But there's still speculation that there are some... Uh, individuals who might throw their their hat in the ring if it, if the opportunity presents itself, and the Ukrainian situation has been a situation to has been an opportunity to put a spotlight on whether some other liberal cabinet ministers have what it takes, perhaps in the long term, to perhaps throw their hat in the ring mm-hmm. if it, if uh, if the ring was open for challengers to step into. Uh, Nick, just going back to the board too, I, I see that the NDP it, it has has had a bit of a, a bump in popularity. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the thing is, is one of the things we have to watch out for is that uh, you know we can see that you know the People's Party is down a little bit, the Green Party is down a little bit, and you know I would expect that some of that bump are from uh, people that like the Greens but are potentially looking at the New Democrats because the New Democrats are very strong on the environmental front. Hmm. And uh, so, you know, I think the the New Democrats have to be watched as a bit of a parking space for voters that might be disaffected with the with the frontline parties. Uh, Nick, I, I want to leave it there. I want to let you get back to your uh, well deserved vacation uh, in in the sun, away away from the uh, harsh uh, Ottawa winter. <laughs> so, as always, Nick, uh, thank you very much. Take it easy. <laughs>